Hello, Wonder Hussy here, out in the middle of nowhere, in the desert, in far Southern California, in the middle of January. It's like 80 degrees, it feels amazing. But I'm in a place called the Chuckwalla Mountains. And it's a place I've been wanting to go for a long time because gosh, about two years ago, someone sent me a link to this article <laughs> about these two women from a hundred years ago who used to go out exploring this part of the desert. That's right, a hundred years ago. So even longer than a hundred years ago, I think they started rolling around like 1910, 1920, back around then. Uh, the one, the older one was the postmistress in Mecca, which is a little town north of the Salton Sea. So she worked as the postmaster, postmistress out there. Uh, but on her days off, she was really into exploring the desert. And so can you imagine back in 1910, she had a Model T Ford that she would get in and there weren't any roads back then. So this woman had, well, she had cojones of steel. Let me tell you something. Her name was Susie Keefe Smith. And then I don't know exactly what year, because there wasn't a lot of information about these women online, but at some point her cousin came out from Tennessee. She had a, a younger cousin who was about nine years younger than her. And I guess I was having some kind of family problems back in Tennessee. So her cousin came out to stay with Susie out in the desert and the two of them together just fell in love with this area. Any chance they got, they would, the two gals would pile into their old Model T you know, they always had like a spare tire and a 38 pistol strapped on their waist and they wore like man's clothes, cowboy hats, and they would go out here into the desert just to take photographs. Okay, you have to remember something. This was 19, well, we'll just say like 1920-ish when they were doing this. Like women did not just go out into the desert on their own without a chaperone, especially out, you know, into this. Basically, it was wilderness back then. I mean, think about 1920 way down here by the Mexican border, there's banditos, there's prospectors, there's, you know, jaguars running around. It was a wild place, man. And these two women, the older one, Susie, she was 29 and her cousin was 21. Her cousin's name was Lula May, Lula May from Tennessee. They would just go rolling around the desert with their camera gear and take all these amazing photos of, you know, the old prospectors and burrows and plants and snakes and anything they came across that they thought was interesting. And you can see plenty of their photos online to this day. Uh, I guess when Susie died, she died without any uh, family. I don't know if she had kids or not. There's really not a lot of biographical information about these women online, but when she died, for whatever reason, she didn't have any heirs or family. So all her effects ended up getting thrown out into a dumpster. But some archeologist uh, was poking through and found all her old photo albums and realized, because by now it was 1988, he realized, wow, this is a document of a period of the American West that it's a bygone era. And this is, a, a well, this is an amazing documentation of it. So went in the dumpster, got all her photo albums out, and now you can look them up online. You can buy books of their photos, postcards, all kinds of stuff. Anyway, one of the coolest places that Susie and Lula May found while they were exploring is right here in the Chuckwalla Mountains. It's this little oasis called Corn Springs. Now I'm walking up on it right now, but unfortunately it's a hundred years after Susie and Lula May were out here. And so things are a little bit different. So I'm gonna turn the camera around and show you this oasis, but you're gonna have to use your imagination and try to picture what it looked like a hundred years ago before there was all this agriculture in the Imperial Valley that sucked the water table down and kind of killed off most of the greenery. Okay, so imagine it being much more green and lush. Okay, so here we are walking down this road in the middle of this beautiful but stark and very barren desert landscape. And then all of a sudden, look, oh, it's a little oasis with a bunch of palm trees. And like I said, well, it probably doesn't look that impressive right now because most of the palm trees are dead. And I guess that's partly because the water table got sucked down because of all the agriculture that came up in the area. But also I guess there were, uh, I think there's been some fires in the intervening years, whatever the case. I think at one time there was like 60 palm trees blooming or growing down here. And now there's only, I think 12. So it's not nearly as lush as it once was. And there's not nearly as much shade as there once was, but I think it's still gonna be a pretty cool place to poke around and see if we can find any traces of what it was like when Susie and Lula Mae were down here. 
Now you might be able to see there's a an RV, a few rigs parked here and there. Well, that's because it's actually a BLM campground nowadays. Well, back in the day that Susie and Lula May first came out here, I mean, again, it was frustrating. I couldn't figure out exactly what year they first came out here, but they basically rolled around photographing the desert from like 1910 to 1930, so like a 20 year span. So sometime in there in the 20s, they used to come down here and basically just hang out. I think they would camp out for extended periods and maybe even kind of live here. I'm not sure, but at one time there was apparently this kind of bohemian, bohemian squatters camp up here at this little oasis, Corn Spring Oasis. So in addition to the two photographer ladies, there was a, just a really colorful assortment of desert characters. Like some of the old prospectors from up in the Truckwalla Mountains would come down and hang out and rest in the shade. And there was, a, there were supposed to be Mexican cowboys. And there was even supposed to be this English jockey. Oh, this is what I read online. An English jockey who had been kicked in the face by a horse one too many times and decided to retreat out to the desert and spend the rest of his days out here. So basically it was just a very eclectic group of, well, kind of like a group of misfits, I guess, living in this little oasis in this desolate area of the desert. Sounds like paradise to me, man. It's like never, never land out here. Nobody would have messed with them because you know, this is remote even nowadays. I came down I-10 to get here. We're sort of, I guess, halfway between Blythe, California and like the Salton Sea area-ish. Uh, but back in the 20s, there wasn't even like paved roads that came out here. And can you imagine these girls, or excuse me, these women, I mean, 21, 29 years old, these women driving this Model T Ford down these dusty, dirt, desert roads? I mean... It, like I said earlier, talk about brass friggin' balls, man. I thought I was cool for going out and exploring the desert, but I ain't nothing compared to Susie and Lula May. But I do feel a huge kinship with these women. They kind of remind me of me and my sister. If you've been watching my channel for a long time, uh, you know that I have a sister with whom I'm very close and she used to travel around with me a lot and she also loves the desert. And little known fact, she and I are trying to go in together and buy some property somewhere in the desert and start our own little, well, our own little bohemian enclave. Maybe something like what Corn Springs was back in its heyday. Okay, we're coming up on the campground now and I don't want to talk too loud because it's so still out here. And these people that came out here to camp, well, obviously they came out here because they wanted solitude. But you can see that a lot of these palm trees are dead now. It's just terrible. Imagine if all those palm trees had full lush green canopies. This would be a true shady desert oasis. Oh, there's my friend Scott in the distance. That's right, I'm here with a friend. Uh, we've been camping and exploring all over this part of the desert, kind of based out of Quartzsite, Arizona, for the last several days. And well, we're camped right up, at, right up the road at another really interesting place that I'll show you later, but for now, we just decided to hike down here and we'll see if we can find anything at all left over from the, well, from the heyday of Corn Spring. I mean, this must have been such an amazing place in the middle of this desert. It's kind of eerie. You know, it's like, I go to a lot of these abandoned places, abandoned houses. Well, this is sort of like, well, this is sort of like walking through an abandoned house. An abandoned bohemian misfit camp. Now I should note, it is January, I think it's January 14th today, and it's just beautiful, 80 degrees, but whew, I can't imagine being here in the summertime, especially with, well, especially with most of the tree cover gone. You know what I mean? Like if all these trees were, had full tops, at least there'd be a lot more shade. Apparently there was so much water running through here that there was like little swimming holes or wading holes, like kind of almost like a little creek, I guess. But uh, apparently they had this, shaded kind of central area where they would all hang out with the uh, hammocks and writing desks. They even had like little desks set up so everybody could just kind of hang out in the shade and do their work. I mean, it kind of sounded like, well, it just sounded like the classic bohemian gypsy camp, you know? It sounds a lot like a place I would like to live. I mean, look at this giant tamarisk tree. These salt cedar or tamarisk trees are invasive species. So in a lot of places, the, uh, the government's going around trying to tear them down because they suck all the water out of the ground. And well, these giant tamarisks might be part of the problem that killed those palm trees, which the palm trees aren't native either. So I guess it's fair game, but these tamarisks, say what you will about them. They do grow big and green and shaggy and they provide a lot of nice shade. 
Anyway, we can kind of just look around and imagine what this was like 100 years ago. Like I said, everything was much greener and more lush. And there were little desks. <laughs> Probably with those old-timey typewriters on them scattered about. Hammocks hanging from the trees. Old prospectors dropping in to tell their tales and have a shot of whiskey. And if you read about it online, some of the prospectors in this area were... They seemed pretty cool. Like, there was this one guy... Oh, I can't remember what they called him. Tiny Tommy Thompson or something because he was only five feet tall. And he was a prospector who lived way up in these mountains somewhere around here. But he would come down every once in a while and hang out. And, well, when he passed away, I guess they went to clean out his cabin. And they found a book of Robert Burns' poetry in his cabin. So even though he was like a real rough, crusty prospector, well, apparently he had a soft side and he liked poetry. And they even found that he had written a bunch of poems of his own. Uh, they're written on the walls of the cabin. He wrote his own really kind of simple homespun desert poetry. And then there was this other guy in the area. I think his name was Jack Lederer. Uh, don't quote me on that, but another prospector in the area who had, you know how the prospectors always had their faithful mule with them? And those poor prospectors' mules really put up with a lot of, well, rough treatment. Well, not Jack's mules. They were like his family. And apparently the story is that he would make flapjacks every morning and feed one giant flapjack to each of his mules. So I guess his mules were treated better than some. There's supposed to be a lot of really cool petroglyphs in the hills all around this little oasis. And my friend Scott knows where they are. So I guess I'm going to walk on back over to him and see if he's done talking and ready to go check out some petroglyphs. Oh, hold everything. Look at this. It's an old pull tab from a beer can that hasn't been in use since like 1972, just laying right out here in the open. You know, that just goes to show how remote this place is, that this thing is just laying out here. Uh, no one's picked it up, thrown it away or whatever. But I happen to have with me, and Scott is very excited by this. Yeah, like Someone sent me a field guide to beer tabs, like what year they're from. So I'm going to take this back to our camp when we get back and see what year this date's from. I can't actually wait to know. <laughs> okay, he's excited. Go ahead and make your bets and we'll see who's right. Holy moly, this is just beautiful. Oh wow, look, there's some petroglyphs. Holy cow, they're right here off the road. Man, that's cool. Wow, look at these. Yeah, there's a bunch of them all over these rocks. Okay, so just down the road here on this rock face, Scott says there's some more modern well, you could call them petroglyphs, you could call them graffiti. Look, like it says Rose, Joe. J Rose and Joe, 1884. Wow. I don't know, man. I've said this before in videos, like, gosh, it's just interesting to me. When does, uh, when does graffiti become a historical artifact? Like, 1884, these white people came in and carved in a sacred Native American space. So you could go, oh, gee, that's terrible. So now what if I today come in here and write my name over that? Well, then somebody would go, hey, that's terrible. That's from 1884. You know, it's all relative. Okay, so Scott was just saying, over here, there's more, uh, well, white man writings. But over here, they wrote them directly over the petroglyphs. So he said, he has no problem with Rose and Joe over there. You know, they chose a rock that didn't have anything on it, and that's fine. But why do you got to go up and write it right over one of the ancient petroglyphs? That's kind of messed up. It just seems rude. I mean, there's plenty of rock faces to write on. Why do you have to go right there? Roman... And Charlie, just right over it. Coming up the rocks here, there's this weird drawing that somebody carved into the rock, obviously done by a white person. I don't know if you can see that. Scott thinks it's Nixon. <laughs> Nixon with hair. It does look, you know what? That actually does look like Nixon. That looks a lot like Nixon. I'm not kidding. The nose, you know, and the mouth. It is. Well, who came in here and put a Nixon petroglyph up here? Well, I'll be a monkey's uncle. Okay, we've arrived at the next point of interest on our little hike, and that is, it's a plaque referring to Gus Laterer. That's the prospector I was talking about who fed his mules flapjacks. It says, well, I don't know if he's, is he buried here? Uh, up at Aztec Well. Oh, he's buried up the road a few miles, but this is a little monument to him. It says, Gus Laterer, born 1868, died 1932. So he lived a decent length life for those days. Prospector, burrow fancier, vegetable gardener, mayor of Corn Springs. Burrow fancier, that could be taken in a couple of different ways, but I'm just gonna remember the fact that he made flapjacks for his burrows. 
You know, peoples have been living in this beautiful canyon for many, many hundreds of years, and it's really not hard to see why, especially when you look at it from this vantage point. I think it might be time for a sunset cocktail. So we might have to head back up to where we're camping, which is super cool too. Okay, so we just hiked up from the uh, Corn Springs Oasis down there, about half a mile up the road to our campsite, which is amazing. <laughs> it's an old miner's cabin. Look at this. It's this really cool old stone cabin where I guess some old miner or prospector lived that worked well, some kind of little mine in this area. And well, it's a campsite now. You can camp right out here. It's this beautiful little fire ring where we're gonna have ourselves a little campfire later tonight. And then this amazing view out over the wash that goes down to Corn Spring. And you can see the sun's going down, the mountains are lit up all gold and beautiful. Just amazing down here right now. Okay, well, while we still have some daylight, I'll show you what it looks like in this little cabin. Okay, this isn't really a cabin you would you probably wouldn't want to stay the night in here, although it does have this amazing screened-in porch area out front with a little old spring for a mattress. So if you wanted to just sleep out in the open, this would actually be very pleasant. But inside the little stone cabin, the enclosed part, well, it's actually pretty tidy. I suppose you could sleep in here. Oh, before we go in, look. I guess these are some of his old cups and... There's a lid to a, or a neck of a bottle somebody found out here. Whoa, that looks like kind of an old bottle, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, look, check this out. It's really neat in here. Old stone cabin. One room, not much. Real nice fireplace. You could have a cozy fire in there. <laughs> somebody left a Jägermeister bottle up top. It's pretty bare bones. Most of the windows are intact, though. Not really many supplies laid in, unfortunately. I mean, here we have a few dishes, a few pieces of silver, some drill bits, and a real old can of Coleman fuel that, well, it's probably empty. Oh, maybe this is the can that pop tab came off that we found. Still gotta look that up. And then just like any of these cabins, there's uh, guidebooks. I'll check those out later, see who's been here. But there's also some historical information on the walls in here. Now they make it seem like this is the guy who lived in this cabin. Uh, old time prospector who lived out here for a hundred years. John De La Garza. Apparently he walked here from Moapa, Nevada, all the way to Needles. Moapa is like north of Las Vegas. That's, I drove down here from Vegas and it took me about well, from Moapa, it would have taken five hours, and this guy walked all the way down here, fell in love with the area, and, well, never left. And he was here in the glory days of Corn Springs. He got here in, well, he got here in 1930, which was kind of at the end of when those women were coming out here, but, you know, he saw a lot of the old characters and uh, hung out here just prospecting his whole life. Says he never married. He lived a solitary life in the cabin at Morningstar Mine. Okay, so you would think that this is that cabin where he lived? No, like he lived in another cabin that's up the road even farther. There's a little settlement called Aztec Wells about three miles up the road. I guess he lived up there. This cabin belonged to somebody else and for whatever reason, they don't have that information posted. But look, here's some more information about the Chuckwallas and about Corn Springs and there they are. Susie Smith and Lula Mae Graves laying in their hammocks between those same two trees we just looked at. How cool is that? And then look down here, here's a, Remember I was talking about that little prospector that they called Tiny Tommy Jones or gosh, I can't remember his nickname, but the, the one that was a poet. Well, as a matter of fact, look, they have one of his poems posted on the wall here. Corn Springs Feelings. Falling, 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 winding, 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 swirling, 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 sighing, 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 all the world defying, whining, 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 crying, crying, crying. Angry, angry, angry now. Screaming, screaming, screaming. Roaring, roaring, roaring. Well, I'm not gonna read you the whole thing, but basically it's supposed to be like the sound of the wind. He was trying to describe what the wind sounds like. Like sometimes it comes blasting down this canyon. And sometimes like just now, it's just a gentle breeze that cools you off. 
Well, how cool is it that this rough-hewn, crusty old prospector wrote that poem? I think that's so cool, man. Okay, so that's the screened-in front porch. There's that little cabin we just went in. And then there's this, I guess this was kind of like his workroom, whoever lived here. Nice wooden floor, though. And there's some little ore samples, rocks that were collected. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna walk a distance away and then I'm gonna do a 360. So you can just appreciate the beauty of where I am. And maybe imagine that you're here with me. <laughs> Look at my rig parked right next to the cabin. It's a great place to spend the night. Okay, tonight we're having margaritas with a little bit of jalapeno added for extra kick. A little bit of lime and then I cut it with club soda because, you know, margarita mix is so much sugar. Yeah, I, I like to make my margaritas with club soda and just a splash of mix. Downside to that is, this is pre-made margarita mix, so it's not going to have as much liquor in it. But the upside to that is, well, I can drink more of them. Okay, time to sit down and have a sunset cocktail, and there's one final order of business, and that is, we got to identify what year this little pull tab is from. Okay, so one of my viewers was kind enough to send me this guide to the various types of tabs you find laying around in the desert. And so it's pretty clear that what we're looking at here, well, it's not post-1975, and it's not pre-1965. That means it was sometime between 1965 and 1975. Wow, this little pull tab is almost an historical artifact. Right, well, cheers, Scott. Here's to a fantastic... 80 degree day. Yeah, beautiful summer day in the desert. Chuck Wallace. Ooh.